Hello and welcome again to Star Wars The Mandalorian Armor, or as we call it here, the audio book of Boba Fett, here on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. My name is Harrison Bullman, I will be reading for you today, and you can follow me on Twitter at Harrison Bullman. And if you are new to this audiobook or you want to find a specific part of the audiobook, look in the description below, which has links to every part. Before we continue reading chapter 20, I just want to say hi to some folks in the comments, some of the guys who mentioned, uh, who gave answers to the questions I gave last week. Uh, so Matt Curtis, let's start with you, always good to have you Mac. Mac says a crying face emoji when Bosk finds out that Boba Fett is alive, and Mac can, uh, confirms to me that the S noise is used for most of the lizard aliens in Star Wars Legends. Thank you, Mac. I wasn't too certain on that. I'm glad I have your expertise here. Uh, Tyler Mitch, who uh, not only says that he's finally caught up, thank you very much, Tyler. Glad you got there. Uh, but Tyler also let us know about his original start with Star Wars. He said, I started with the original trilogy back in the early 2000s. I remember going with my dad to rent the tapes at a movie rental place. The Phantom Menace was also out, so I saw that too. Then, Attack of the Clones hit theatres a few years later. Ah, Tyler, the fact that you mentioned renting tapes instead of DVDs ah, makes my heart feel all warm and fuzzy for those good old nostalgic days. And 74 Widow X, also known as the up-and-coming rapper Black Widow, <laughs> uh, says, um, no. You have to read the book of Anakin and Vader. So apparently Vader ordered the hit on Owen and uh, Baru for letting his mom die. He never forgave them and was watched them being executed. He also says that the, the Jawas told the stormtroopers where they lived. I see. Well, thank you very much for answering, guys. I don't know how much we're actually going to have of this episode. This might be a short one. You will know before me because you can see the runtime of this video. And for me, the video has not yet been made. So enjoy listening to me discover the possible end of this book. And to give you a little idea, because we finished a little abruptly the last one, here we are in chapter 20, and uh, we have Boba Fett and Neela and Dengar under attack from the uh, vicious Hamame and Fedroy, I believe is the other guy. And uh, Neela just pointed out that the cave they're in, she said, we're stuck in here. This hole doesn't go anywhere. It wasn't meant to. Boba Fett didn't look back around at her. You don't get anywhere by running away from creatures like these. Good theory. Across the cave, Dengar held his blaster rifle close against his chest, watching the shifting shadows in the darkness outside, waiting for another chance at a well-aimed shot. Gets a little tight when you try to put it into practice. Boba Fett gave a small shrug, his shoulders scraping against the rock behind him. Don't worry about it. His voice remained as calm and drained of apparent emotion as before. Everything's under control. What are you talking about? From the back of the cave, Neela stared at the bounty hunter in dismay. She had already come to the limit of the space, no more than a few meters from the opening in the hillside's rocky slope. There's no way out of here. They've got us pinned down. They can either wait us out till your blasters are exhausted, or they can call in more of their friends. A couple more shots blazed through the middle of the cave, striking the roof above her and showering a rain of scorched rock shards. Either way, they've got us. As I said, don't worry. The bounty hunter's calm response infuriated Neela. The thought of dying in this hole or worse, being dragged out of it after the pair outside had finished off Boba Fett and Dengar, infuriated her. I didn't escape from Jabba's palace to wind up like this. There were still too many things she didn't know, too many questions without answers. Her real name, where she had come from, how she had gotten here, to let bleed away into the sand. If there had been any chance of pulling it off, she would have grabbed one of the blasters out of the other's hands and made a break, firing and charging headlong at the two-man siege force outside. Anything would be better than waiting here for the inevitable. Dengar turned his face away from the cave opening. If you've got some kind of plan... 
The blaster rifle's muzzle touched his chin as he held the weapon in a diagonal line across his chest. I'd appreciate being let in on it. If there was anything you could do about it, one way or the other, I might tell you. Boba Fett fired a quick couple of bursts outside before glancing over at Dengar. But there isn't. All you have to do is wait and you'll see. That's great, said Neela sourly. She had to raise her voice over the noise of another fusillade streaking through the dark and carving the back of the cave out in sparks. Her disgust had reached the point where nothing, not even laser bolts, could make her flinch. All this time, I thought you were recovering from what happened to you. Only it turns out that your brains are still fried. Boba Fett made no reply. Hold your fire, he instructed Dengar. But they've come in closer. Dengar used the rifle muzzle to point outside. The one that was out in the dunes. He's moved up. He's got an even better angle now. It's all right. I want the two of them together, or close enough. Why? Dengar looked puzzled. You think you can take them both out? I can cover you if you want to take a shot at it. That won't be necessary. The flashes from the weapons outside were enough for Neela to tell that Dengar was correct. The two besiegers were now within a couple of meters of each other, crouching down behind a shallow lip of rock. From there, they would be able to fire straight into the cave. Don't bother trying to talk to him, Neela nodded toward Boba Fett. He's so far gone, he can't tell when there's no way. A sudden noise interrupted her. From above, as though the night itself had split open, the sound grew from a distant shriek to a roar that spanned the audible frequencies. The cave itself vibrated, as had the one containing the Sarlacc's still-living segment. Dust sifted from cracks spidering overhead. Then, pebbles and finally broken rocks large enough to cut Neela's arm as she shielded her brow. From underneath her forearm, she could see Dengar leaning forward, blaster rifle lowered, gazing outside in wonderment. His shadow leapt toward her, as did that of Boba Fett. Both bounty hunters were silhouetted by the fiery glare that had banished what was left of the night. The encircled sand dunes were lit up as though by the fall of Tatooine's twin sons. Beyond the cave's mouth, the two other figures were visible, turning onto their sides and raising their outspread hands, trying to ward off the weight rushing down toward them. All that happened in a few seconds. From the first whisper and bare glow to the half-rounded shape that appeared just above the desert floor, balanced on the fiery column of its landing engines. One of the two men was able to scramble to his feet and run, making a final dive headlong that took him beyond the quickly braked impact of the ship. The other managed only to get to his knees, blaster rifle pressed into the sand beneath his palm, then the tail of the craft, nozzles blackened and still hot, crushed him flat. Oh! Dengar's voice broke the silence, the thrusting roar replaced by the glassy crackle of the molten sand cooling. It's your ship. It's the Slave One. Neela realized what had happened. He got through, she thought. On the calm unit. The link between the gear inside his helmet, the small transceiver antenna mounted at the side, and the equipment that Dengar had fetched back from Moss Eisley spaceport. Boba Fett must have gotten that up and running just before the other two men had shown up and all the time that that one named Hamame had been talking, and then when he had swung the blaster rifle up onto his hip. Fett had been sending a signal straight to his ship, outside Tatooine's atmosphere, giving Slave One, as Dengar had called the craft, the exact coordinates of this location, exact enough to bring it right down on the heads of the two men. One of them was still partly visible underneath the ship, a leg and an arm showing, his weapons lying on the sand just a few inches away from his fingers. He wouldn't be making any deals anytime soon. Come on, 
Boba Fett moved toward the cave's opening. Let's get going. There's no reason to hang around here. She didn't know whether he had been speaking to both of them or just to Dengar, but she wasn't taking any chances. Neela let the two men go before, at a quick sprint toward the Slave One ship. From the darkness of the surrounding dunes, a volley of laser bolts scorched the sand at their feet. The other besieger hadn't given up yet. Neela didn't let that stop her from following after Boba Fett and Dengar and quickly scooping up the dead man's blaster rifle as she ran. Hold it! At the hatchway of the ship, Neela raised the weapon, her thumb at its firing stud. Stop right there! Dengar was already inside, with one gloved hand grasping the side of the hatch. Boba Fett turned and looked over his shoulder, his visored gaze meeting that of the blaster rifle's muzzle. You're not going anywhere without me, said Neela coldly. Boba Fett's hand shot out before she could react, the motion faster than her eye could perceive. His fist locked onto the rifle barrel. With a quick twist of his arm, he had wrenched it out of her grasp. The weapon went spinning through the air as he flung it away, landing within inches of the corpse's unmoving arm. They stood looking at each other for a moment. Then Boba Fett reached down and grabbed Neela's wrist and pulled her upward toward the hatchway. Don't be stupid. Fett's grasp tightened, squeezing the bones together. I'm the one who decides who goes and who stays, and right now you're too valuable a piece of merchandise to leave behind. A second later, she was inside the ship, with the hatchway door sliding shut behind herself. Brace yourself, said Fett as he headed for a metal ladder at the side of the space. We are leaving now. Neela rubbed her aching wrist. As she looked about herself, at the bleak metal bars of the cages, she realized, though she didn't know when, in what part of her shrouded past, that she had been here before. That is so entirely typical. Shelby tilted his head unit back watching the ship ascend swiftly into the night sky. You go to all that trouble fixing them up, putting them back together, and they don't even bother to thank you. Ingratitude. Lexi stood next to the taller medical droid. They had both come creeping out of their hiding places when the shooting had finally stopped. By now, even the human out in the dunes had presumably left heading back to whatever den of iniquity he had come from. At least, there was no longer any indication of his presence. That was a further disappointment to both droids. After an encounter with Boba Fett, the man might have had some interesting wounds to take care of. Thoughtlessness. But of course, what else can you expect? The ship's glowing trail had already dwindled to a speck of light among the stars. The hope had formed inside Shelby's circuits, to the degree that a droid could have hope, that it and Lexi would have been taken along with the humans, particularly the one they had nursed back to health, the one named Boba Fett. They would have certainly been able to earn their energy sources, what with the considerable amount of tissue damage he had the knack for creating. It's their nature, I suppose. All flesh thinks it's immortal. Shelby brought its gaze down from the sky to the surrounding empty desert. Now what? Unemployment, squeaked one e Exe's voice. Needlessness. Shelby looked at its companion for a moment. Then it extruded one of its scalpel-tipped arms and scraped a spot of rust from Lexi's dented carapace. You know, Shelby's voice spoke with measured consideration. You could use a little maintenance. And that's the end of chapter 20. Okay, so I am very, very fascinated to see what happens because is Boba going to be summoning the slave one to him with a bosk inside of it? Like, it was pretty cool to, to have him just crush a dude with the slave one. That was pretty sweet. Um, and... 
a very good way to get out of the the situation. Um, but yeah, like, like that has whole implications. If you remember from the last episode and one of the previous chapters, yes, Bosk was inside the Slave One, uh, looking through data that Boba Fett had inside a listener droid. That which we mentioned uh, earlier with um, Black Widow's comment, contained footage of the deaths of uh, Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen. Now, very interesting to see what happens there. Very interesting to see how Boba Fett's going to react to finding Bosk trying to scavenge his ship. It's also interesting, Neela. So we've had the... Um, sort of revelation that Neela has been a piece of merchandise that Boba Fett acquired once before. So it feels like Neela at the beginning of the story was hoping that Boba Fett was perhaps some kind of saviour for her, some sort of rescuer, um, that he would be able to help her, that she was someone that maybe could help her at least remember where she was. But we're now really getting that definite... Um, vibe that actually he was more of a villain perhaps before she lost lost her memory she was perhaps um, actually captured by him and taken to Jabba's palace could very well be that it is Boba's fault that she's had her memories erased although not his fault I suppose since he is a bounty hunter who works on contracts it wasn't his decision for that to happen it was simply that he facilitated it to happen um does that make you feel any different about Boba Fett you know, if, uh, like, neela has been a kind of main character, we've sort of grown to care about her a little bit, although I have to say we haven't really actually seen that much of her in this movie. Um, movie. Book. Um, and a lot of all of her story is still a mystery, and I believe will remain a mystery. Um, because I don't, I don't think there's going to be much revealed in the little we have left of this book. And this is going to be a very short episode. Um, so before I move on, to chapter 21, which I can see is the last chapter. Let's do a few more comments. So some of these are just guys being really nice. Um, TJ Templar, thanks so much for joining us. TJ says, great job, man. You should do this professionally. Ah, oh, buddy, I wish I could. I wish I could just read books that I love for a living. That would be wonderful. Um, but hey, maybe we'll figure out some way to get some money. But for the moment, we're going to do this for the love and for the uh, the fun times I have chatting with you guys here. Tony Vlashin. Uh, Tony, thank you. You're a regular. I love to see you. Says, look forward every week to this. You do a great job. Really appreciate it, man. Mike Poshins, Pochins, uh, says, I love the bird guy voice. Lol, thank you, dude. The bird guy voice is pretty fun for me to do. I like doing some kind of crazy stuff. Taco Supreme, in the comments of our first video in this audiobook, uh, has recently said, great job, great voices, keep it up. Taco Supreme, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of this. I hope you stay listening long enough to hear this call out right at the very end. Um, and it is sad to bring this to an end. Um, which I want to mention with uh, Will West, who on a previous video has commented, I love your voice, bud. A lot of haters out there uh, read over their complaints. M you know what, Will? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the encouragement. And I have to say, actually, there really aren't that many haters. Everyone has been so wonderful and so nice and really joined in with this audiobook. It's been so fantastic for me. I'm legitimately sad that I'm about to start the last chapter. And it is, there's like barely any pages in this chapter. I'm really sorry that we're finishing on, on such a short video. I didn't realise last week I would, I would have pushed... But uh, we, we could have ended up with, with a super long video uh, if we had. Anyway, here it is. Let's enjoy it while it lasts. And afterwards, we can all talk about our speculations for the sequel. Um, and I can be non-committal about when I'm actually going to read the sequel. Uh, I think we might do it when there's a next Mandalorian season on Disney+. Plus. But let's now move on to chapter 21. He hated to do it. But Bosk knew he had to. The greed impulses in his Trandoshan brain, as hardwired as any droid circuits, almost overruled all the others. He could hear the words inside his head. Ancient bounty hunter wisdom told to him by his own father. The live ones are worth more than the dead ones. Old Kradosk had known what he was talking about, at least about that. Whenever Bosk ran his clawed hands along the picked clean bones he'd kept as mementos, 
He had a renewed sense of legacy and tradition. But even so, another truth remained, equally hard and obdurate. Things were different when you were dealing with a creature like Boba Fett. On the screen of the Hound's Tooth's long-distance scanner, in the cramped cockpit, Bosk could see the tiny speck of light that represented Fett's ship. The Slave One had already left the surface of Tatooine, as Bosk had known it would. Soon, within seconds, it would be beyond the planet's atmosphere, and then it would be within his own sighting and tracking range. That was how little time Bosk had remaining to him to press the button beneath his clawed thumb and accomplish all that was necessary. No time for rethinking his decisions or regretting lost profits. He had been back aboard Slave One, extracting a few more interesting files from its data bank, when the comm controls had lit up like the bright sparks of a disintegrating asteroid. That could only mean one thing that the message about Boba Fett being alive was true, and that he had just reinitiated contact with the ship that he had left in orbit above Tatooine. Bosk had also known what was to follow. Slave One would obediently follow Boba Fett's remote transmitted commands, switch on and prime its engines, and head down to Tatooine to rendezvous with its master. And then, Boba Fett would not only be alive, but free and active in the galaxy once again. Free and active, and the top number one bounty hunter on all the galaxy's scattered worlds. Bosk could feel the rage and fear that had come boiling up inside him. Rage was a familiar emotion. Trandoshans woke up angry. But fear was something new and powerful. It had pushed him into action, quick and efficient. He hadn't wasted any thought on the mysteries that had been so tantalizingly uncovered to him. If the rich and powerful Kuat of Kuat was interested in Boba Fett being alive or dead, so be it. Bosk might still be able to cash in by confirming it to the owner of Kuat Drive Yards. And if there was some connection between Prince Zizor, the Black Sun's hidden ruler, and the raid on the moisture farm at the June Sea Edge? The answers about that weren't going to come from Boba Fett. Bosk would make sure of that. There had been just enough time to haul a sufficient quantity of high thermal explosives over from the Hound's Tooth, conceal them in the holding cages of Fett's ship, and rig the remote triggering device. Then, Bosk had sealed the entrance hatchway of Slave One, disconnected his own ship and watched from his cockpit viewport as the other craft had sped planetward. Now that the ship was heading back into space, bearing its helmeted master, the speck of light had grown larger. Another second and Bosk would have waited too long. All regret was expunged from his heart. He pressed the button on the cockpit's control panel. Instantaneously, the ominous light was transformed into a ball of churning flame, surrounded by extinguishing vacuum. Radiant sparks, bits of heated metal no bigger than a human's hand, drifted away from the core of the explosion, the dust and atoms of the other ship. Bosk leaned back in the pilot's chair, feeling exhausted as the tension began to drain from his coiled muscles. That does it, he thought with relief. Boba Fett's dead now. For good. No regrets. He knew it had to be done. But one thing still puzzled Bosk as he gazed out at the emptiness between the stars. Why did he still feel afraid? And that's it. That's it, we are done. All that is left is to Lori Foster, Lexi House and Shelby House. That Lexi House and Shelby House. See, Lexi and Shelby. I knew that those droid names were a reference to something. There we go. Wow. Okay. So, ending 
ending this whole thing, this whole thing, kicking off with Boba Fett being alive, coming back from the dead, not having perished in the Sarlacc pit, and the damn guy dies again. Wow. Interesting. A lot... Well, not that much to unpack just from that chapter, very simple. Bosk was not still aboard the Slave One. He at least was able to notice that the Slave One was powering up and was able to get across. Although, I do feel a bit like when Bosk is like, when it says he was in the ship and he noticed the controls come to life, but then apparently in between the time that the controls came to life and Boba Fett actually ordered it to go to Tatooine and it started moving, he had time to move across a bunch of high explosives? The, the timeline doesn't quite work out for me. Maybe I've missed something there. But w what a cliffhanger this is. Um, how do you guys feel about this as an end of a book? I have to say that I have been a little disappointed with the conclusions, how much closure we've gotten at the end of this book. There are so many questions that have had almost no reveals, almost nothing telling us more. Neela is one of them. All we've had is this reveal of she's been on the Slave One before, so we can kind of assume, based on that and Boba Fett referring to her as merchandise, that she was indeed one of his targets before he was in the Sarlacc pit. Um, now, I believe very early in the book it said that she was going to be connected to the accountant that ran away from the huts? Oh, not Ofnar Dinid. Not that guy who they went to the Shell Huts planet for. What was the other guy? Neb Possendum? Something Possendum. So that character who had a bunch of information wired into his brain, I believe, is going to be key to this. Um, we also haven't really had anywhere near enough of a delve into the... Uh, Black Sun situation, Prince Zizor. How is he coming into this? This is all, remember, Prince Zizor's plan. Well, I say all of it, at least all the stuff that was in the past. Perhaps not some of the things happening on Tatooine now, but it's all linked to Zizor's plan. And Zizor, I believe they said, is already dead? Is that right? That by the end of this, he's already died? Hmm, am I remembering that wrong? There is so much going on here that I am like, oh wow, you clearly cannot get anything out of this story without going, no, you got to go on to the next book. Um, and we will, we will go on to the next book. I, 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 I'm kind of dedicated to that, I think, here on this channel. Not straight away, I think is what I'm going to say. We won't immediately go on to the next book. Just like we've gone through this book uh, when... Boba Fett, uh, the book of Boba Fett came out on Disney Plus and we did it once a week to sort of carry on our Boba Fett fun. I think what we'll do is we will save this for season three of The Mandalorian. So when that comes out, we'll return to once a week, we get a video with a new Star Wars Mandalorian, but Boba Fett centered book. And we'll move on to the next one, which is Slave Ship. I believe is part two of the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy. And I do hope that we will get either more Boba Fett to do the third book with, or at least more Mandalorian. Maybe something else, or maybe we'll just do it just because we want to know what, what's happening in the damn story. Because I have to say, if we go through the second book and, we, and we're still not getting these revelations, we're still not having these things tied up, whew, what a, it could be a bit of a disappointment, but I will have to admit it's, it's very impressive how they are tying all of this together. It's such a huge interwoven plot that if it does take three books to untangle and to get to the ends of those threads, well, that is definitely an impressive piece of work and definitely an impressive piece of storytelling within the already expansive universe of Star Wars. So let's talk a little bit about what we are going to do next on the channel now that this has ended, because of course you're... I want you guys to keep coming back and keep enjoying books with me. So, this week we are starting a new audiobook. It is starting on Friday and it is a Batman audiobook to celebrate the release of The Batman, the new movie with our boy Robert Pattinson. So, what we're we looking at, well, to tie in with The Batman and its villain, we are reading a book that is, interestingly enough, a tie-in 
a tie-in novel to the Batman Arkham Knight game. So this is Batman Arkham Knight The Riddler's Gambit, set between the events of Arkham City and Arkham Knight, and it's about the Riddler trying to do something big in Gotham to take over as the new Prince of Crime now that the Joker is dead. Very interesting. I'm hoping to do a big release for that, so we're going to have three videos for that coming out this weekend. So we're going to have one on Friday for the opening night, another on Saturday, and another on Sunday. So all opening weekend we can enjoy a bit of Batman audiobook goodness. So I hope you will join me for that, because I think it's going to be a really fun book. I at least am going to have a fair bit of fun trying to do the voices for Batman and his rogues gallery. Although, as previously mentioned on the last episode, kind of happy that Mark ha uh, the Joker is dead in it, um, because I can't really do that voice very well. <laughs>